Continue, but I need to push continue. Okay. Welcome to this week's episode of the Rutledge Perspective. And once again, I am really excited to have an amazing guest. And you are just going to get so much from her. I just know it. And so I'm going to do a quick introduction like I normally do. And then we are going to dive in. So, first, a few quotes from her On the way to our dreams, life happens. What you do with what happens is what matters. I love that quote. A storyteller at heart, I believe that words are power. Words are life. I would like to introduce you to Miriam Haddad, who is amazing. She is an entrepreneurial leader, a motivational speaker, and a developer of powerful narratives and creator of transformational interdisciplinary learning programs. And here's what's cool. So I'm not going to read your, the whole bio to you guys like I normally don't do um, because it's going to be in the show notes, but there's something I want you guys to know about her. And it's going to be an amazing part of her story is um, she has actually performed leading operatic roles and in solo and chamber music recitals as both a classical pianist and a singer. And she's been nationally and internationally on stage, television, and radio throughout her career. Miriam, thank you, thank you, thank you for being on The Rutledge Perspective. I'm so excited to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Laurel. I love, well, everyone, I love Laurel. And <laughs> so it's just an <laughs> honor to be here having this conversation with you but I'm really delighted to have the chance to visit with your audience. And I hope a message flows through me today that will just be perfect for whatever somebody needs today. So thank um, you for having me. Absolutely. I love it. And I know whatever we move through today is going to be exactly what's needed. And, you know, I want to start with, because your story is so interesting, but I want to start with people understanding what are you doing now in the world? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm always doing too many things, but I've learned to focus a lot more. So right now I'm extremely focused. I'm excited. We're about to launch a digital campaign to let the world know about a wonderful program that has been our longest standing one, 14 years and running, that wow. is now moved fully online. So the last three years have been hip deep in the rigors of true product development to bring this program into shape so people all around the world could benefit from it. And so we pull the trigger on that next week. It's been it's been live, but we will let the world know about it. Um, and we have it's, it's called the Amazing Speaker Series. Uh, save our online, yeah. And then um, the other thing I'm up to is also learning to say no to things that don't really fit in our lane and focus and my spirit, which leaves me now 25% of my time to be able to do artistic things and creative things that are inspiring and put them out to community and people. Yes. So I'm getting ready to launch two blogs. One is called Sonríe a la Vida. And what that means is a, sonri a sonrir a la vida is a smile at life, but Yes. not from here from here and I think we all need to remember how to smile at life these days yes <laughs> very powerful stories about courage but um also shared in, in different artistic lenses so mm -hmm. I'm very excited about that I love it well and and that leads us into kind of this next question because your journey is fantastic and so Mary and I we've talked a lot on this podcast about networks and how you meet people and how people come into your life and Miriam and I meet met through a mutual friend and as we started talking one there was just this great connection because of music and art and all of these things but her story is just so fantastic so I want you to tell people kind of how you started and the whole thing, you know, in El Paso and all of that through music into, you know, what you were doing with uh, the communications group. Sure, sure, sure. Well, um, I grew up on the border of El Paso and Juarez on the El Paso side. Yeah. So you could say that I grew up in between Mexican as well as American culture, but yes. really embedded deeply in a very <laughs> tight knit uh, Middle Eastern community. So my family uh, is from Syria. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a Syrian American and I'm actually quite proud of that. I, I'm exceptionally proud of my roots and what my people did coming from Syria, being such hard workers and great contributors to society. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we learned a very good work, work ethic 
uh, we were entrepreneurs from birth. So, you know, at two, dad had already taught us to shake hands, you know, how to communicate, talk to people, how to take a message. And by nine, I, you know, was knocking on doors saying, okay, here's what I can do for you. How much are you going to pay me this summer? Like first music studio at 12. But um, within that scope, I'm a pretty, actually, a lot of people may not get that about me, but I'm actually a very introverted person. I'm, I'm a very inward person. I have a lot of interpersonal intelligence and I love to observe people in the world around me and see how energy flows, how people flow, what dimension they live in and how, and what causes people to not be able to be understood. And by, you know, there's so many dimensions in some of the words that I use by understood Yes, the sound of your words, because there was that. Here you've got heavily yeah. accented Arabic, and here you have somebody who's heavily accent, accented Spanish, but everybody's talking in English, you know? Like, yes. why does that go well sometimes? But I think it's also the heart of the matter. What is it that I want to say that I don't even know that I want to say that I can't say? And then what is it that is that I am saying that's hitting the bias of someone else? And they've got the same thing going on. Right. Um, And so it was just fascinating to me. So it was always a little easier to be quiet, to watch. So you could say that I found, honestly, my true voice at the piano. So I've had a lifelong love affair with the piano. I mean, honestly, my mom had to tell me, go outside to play or go do something else because it was just like this symbiotic relationship. I was like one with it. And it was amazing to me that I could tell a story of my soul without ever having to utter a word. And no matter how I felt, there were different colors, like rainbows coming off of the keys. Um, So it was really uh, my intention at that. I mean, I was involved in in dance and I played the clarinet and I sang and all of that. But piano was was always my my soulmate, you could say. Mm -hmm. And then... um, I really pursued that. I had this vision of, let me be a concert pianist. And Mm -hmm. uh, I had a car accident actually around 20, right before Mm -hmm. I turned 21. Um, I had just been elected Pro Musica Young Artist of the Year. And I had all of these things that were happening and leading up to a formal public debut, which I was not going to give that up. And though I had a lot of nerve damage and muscular damage, um, it was really painful to play, but I decided that yeah. ah, pain, who cares? Let me, right. I'll just go through it. Let me, let me work harder. <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And that, that didn't work. And I had probably one of the greatest lessons and moments mm-hmm. in that after that concert, I took a break to play and a, cu- a couple t- from playing. And then a couple of months later, when I went to restart and start to get ready for master's auditions, Mm -hmm. my left hand did not want to play the piano anymore. Ah, (laughs) Um, So that actually created a huge shift because Mm -hmm. I was not actually able to play again for 10 years, which I, that is where I started to discover all of this you know, I did acupuncture and meditation and the Feldenkrais sticking and all these things that I never knew existed. Mm-hmm. And I realized it was really divine intervention. God had a different plan for me. Um, at that point, um, one of the practitioners that was working with me to help heal, I had had some emotional traumas along the way. And I guess it gets embedded in your muscles. And then yes. you, you, know, you have this big event. And she said, literally, Miriam, your homework is to go sit under a tree, but you can only think about the tree. I was like, ah, (laughs) I take my picnic and I'm sitting under the tree and I'm like, that's a nice tree. And that is literally, it was like, um, a millisecond that I could think of a tree. And then I saw, for the first time, I could really see all my thoughts. And that began development and learning about the mind, about the spirit, about the body. Um, And then from there, I transitioned to opera. And then that was pretty cool because now I was facing my audience and got to be with them. Forgive me. Let me, yeah, that wasn't my alert there. Um, And as I sang and 
I had wonderful people I studied with that were really masterful. One of those people was actually Pavarotti's coach, Joan Sutherland's coach. Um, he was yeah. he had retired from the Metropolitan Opera and um, an old Italian bel canto master of singing. And that, mm -hmm. that was cool. I got my tools from all of those things. Mm -hmm. And actually, had a booming studio, um, two kids at that point. And mm -hmm. I was uh, actually having dinner with my life coach at the time because she was trying mm -hmm. to help me learn how to harness all of this creative and artistic and right. spiritual energy because I have a lot of vision of what I could what was being called through me to do with that yes um and so at dinner one night she starts telling me of a challenge that she was having at an international oil and gas yeah. company mm -hmm. and uh, so they had wonderful beautifully brilliant engineers that needed to speak at this thing I'd never heard of the offshore technology conference yes up and they kind of like redo their papers and it's very important for the company but we can't understand them they're not showing up powerfully as themselves right. their message is not engaging the audience and I said well what have you done and she said well one two three four five and I said well that's not how you're going to train people to get them to perform those are all individual skills, but they're not, they're, they gained knowledge, but it never converted to skill. And it, that skill was never embedded enough to turn into a performance level that they could yes. trust in front of people when they're freaking out. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. And so that first program, Say It With Power, the one that has now become yes. digital, mm -hmm. um, was the kickoff of that. And, and frankly, I fell in love with my class. There were 13 yeah. brilliant people from around the world. And many of them had really, they'd lost their confidence. They weren't speaking yeah. up in meetings anymore. You know, the thought of getting up in front of an audience was utterly repellent to them. Yes. And I know, I know what that feels like, actually. Yeah. And it was wonderful to be able to contribute to people in a very rich way. Yeah that help them learn how to be themselves in front of others and then to really showcase their brilliance and to yeah. feel good about their voice, their way of sharing it, and then to be clear and to be understood. And they, you know, they felt like rock stars and they showed up like rock stars. I mean, we had one yeah. person that won best presenter out of 25 companies. That's great. Uh, yeah, and then one gentleman that actually the class we had, we designated a prize for the best, uh, most yeah. improved by the end of that six week term. Yeah. And uh, the gentleman that was voted stood up like literally won an Academy Award. I mean, he was so shocked. Yeah. And then he tears in his eyes and he said, thank you, Miriam, for giving me my confidence back. Yeah. I will never be ashamed to speak up again. And honestly, yeah. he was the conversion point. Because I loved my studio, I loved music, I still mm -hmm. wanted to perform. And at that point, I realized I'd come to a crossroads and I was being yeah. called something greater than what I wanted to do for me. Yeah. And that's it, just serve. So it was, it, and what I love about that story, and, and so many people that listen to the podcast are kind of stuck or, or they'll ask about career stuff and they don't think about transferable skills and how what they've been told to do or where they've been told they fit is just one little one little piece. And there's so many things that are broad. And so I want to dig deeper into this aha moment that you had where you had this conversation with someone and she's saying all these things they did to train people, right? We're giving them speaking classes and we're doing, you know, Toastmasters and we're doing all these things. But you said, a word that I don't think anybody has ever thought about when they think about speaking, which is perform. They are not yeah. going to be able to get up and perform. And you said that to me when we first met, when you were telling me this story, you're like, you know, it's really about how do you project your voice? How do you show up confidently? How do you perform not being inauthentic, not acting, but how do you perform in a way that people hear your message and understand? So dig a little bit deeper into that transition or the translation of art into kind of this very staunch stalwart corporate, you got to give your paper, you got to, you know, <laughs> talk a little bit about how that, how that came together. Cause no one would put that together, Miriam, nobody. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. 
So I remember, and I should just let you know, the first program that I put together before we launched it mm -hmm. uh, was going to be like, for me, I always look at the Met, like the Metropolitan yes. Opera. What does it take mm -hmm. to sing on that stage? So for me, that first group, well, I'm like, you guys are going to the Met. They yeah, haven't even been trained to get on a county <laughs> stage. Like, oh my gosh, and I have how long to get you ready? So the, the interesting thing is to be able to perform anything. So it has to do with how you've layered it into the subconscious yes. habit, embedded it, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will learn knowledge, but then they don't know how to right. practice. So some people think, well, to prepare means I'm going to go, I don't know, give my speech 20 times. Well, certainly that'll help you. But mm -hmm. I could, I can tell you, I mean, a part of why I started to look at this was as a concert pianist, I would prepare a year on a concerto and I would literally go to a competition and I kid you not, Laurel, mm -hmm. it would be gone. I'd stand up on stage and it was yeah. like I had amnesia, like even to the yes. point of who am I? Like, yes. who am I? And yes. what is that thing? And why am I on the stage? Like, <laughs> Right? And so I had to really look at why is that happening? Yes. Because the idea that practice makes perfect is baloney. Yeah. Because honestly, I was practicing 16 hours a day. Wow. Yeah. And I had a professor, he, he was actually the assistant for a very famous pianist, Leon Fleischer. Mm -hmm. And he challenged me, Kwang Wu Kim. Kwang Wu, if you're hearing this, hello yep. and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and he basically challenged me. He said, Miriam, how does Rubenstein only practice four hours a day and run a worldwide concert tour and he can get up and perform? Why the 16 hours? And it really made me stop and mm -hmm. think. And then oh. he gave me a challenge. So your challenge for the next week is, how do you convert one hour of your practice into an effective five minutes? Mm. Hmm. And then of those five minutes, how are you going to build this set of performances with varying pieces mm -hmm. of music? Right. And how are you going to, to get up and perform? Mm -hmm. And so that was when I realized that a part of the education that had been missing had a lot to do with how I prepared because how we prepare is how we perform. Yeah. So um, we really are artists, but there are so many blocks. Like everybody maybe can get to the point where they do well in their living room, but right. now something happens in the external world, right? Like now you're on the stage, whatever the stage may be. Maybe it's a job right. interview. Maybe it's leading your team for the first time. Maybe you got promoted to an executive position. Maybe yes. you're dealing with your board, like what right. that is, what is your stage mm -hmm. and what are your triggers? And what do I mean by trigger? If you look at the brain and how it functions, there are certain triggers that can put our amygdala in a hijack. As a mm -hmm. result, like all of the emotional history that we have kind of comes flooding to the forefront. So right. now all of a sudden you get all this head chat that is an extremely yes. loud volume. Why do, you, why do you think you can stand up here? Who do right. you think you are? Why would anybody want to listen to you, right? Yes. So we'll call them the, the enemy. Let's just call mm -hmm. them the enemy, wanting to just come in and steal from you the beauty that was put in your soul and intended to come out because yes. there are such gifts that you have. So it's helping people first to get out of their own way, mm -hmm. to tune that out, to tune into what is mm -hmm. powerful for them, and then it's also, there's a technical side to it. Mm -hmm. How do mm -hmm. I work on my craft and my yes. conveyance of that craft? So mm -hmm. that now when I talk about it, I've prepared my message, but I've also prepared yes. myself. So it's all about alignment, alignment from inside, the conversation you have with yourself. For me, mm -hmm. it goes higher, the conversation I have with God, and yes. then into myself. And once I'm in alignment with that, then I got to ask mm -hmm. myself, what am I really trying to say? What do I want yes. to say? You know, and then just like I may play a piece of music, I I have to be agile. It's more like jazz improvisation. Yes. Like I'm playing a Beethoven sonata. Well, there's a lot more accepted practices about that Beethoven sonata mm -hmm. than there are about a jazz improv on the girl from Ipanema, right? Right. 
So, but the thing is that jazz people do is they get up and they're agile and they create a conversation in the moment together, yes. having really let go of the way that they, maybe they practice it, but they practice it in different iterations to be able to do yeah. that. So we have to train in agility. We have to train in fluidity. My clients get used to me saying all the time, all right, take one. Okay, that was good. Do this, this, this. Okay, take two. All right, that was good. Now this, it's usually four to five takes before everything like sinks together. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's why we always need expert coaches. So you mentioned Toastmasters. Toastmasters is an amazing place to practice. Right. Mm -hmm. You're going to get peer-to-peer -peer feedback. You're not going right. to get people that have been trained on a world-level stage, trained by world-class people that see right. you as beautiful art and say, wait a minute, that color that you're giving of your spirit is beautiful. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Um, I have a client that is a global personality and mm -hmm. was on a panel, okay? And in her first uh, interview with this group, yeah. it wasn't with a panel. And we said, you know what? Mm -hmm. Let's go for lead. Let's go for heart as yes. a leader. That was not quite the right combination to bring mm -hmm. her role to life authentically. So for the next time, I said, let's flip it. Yeah. You be the leader, but with lots of heart. And then it was yes. like, there it is. But if yeah. you don't have somebody that knows how to shape roles mm -hmm. and direct and pull it out of you like taffy that's yeah. really hard to do by yourself right yeah. um, so that's that's kind of you know the kind of things that we do to get yeah. people to be able to perform as them to set them yeah. free to let their voice be heard yeah. but then we also work on all the technical things like how do you use your voice how do you enunciate clearly yes and then how do you do that work on it but not think about it when you're in front of people. See, that's just, it's just masterful. And, and you guys that are listening now, you know why I really wanted to have her on here because all of those words alignment, I'm always talking about alignment. When something doesn't feel right, you are not aligned. When you talk about kind of the head trash, I call it head trash, right? Um, uh -huh. All of that stuff that, that tells us we're not enough. We're not worthy. It's not us. We can't do all of that noise that gets in the way of where we're supposed to be, where our spirit is leading us. And that the importance of that messaging, right? And in fact, this, the week before I'm posting this podcast, I talked about the message versus the messenger and how sometimes we need that information repeated to us, even if it's the exact same words we just said, out loud, when we hear it coming back to us into our ears instead of out of our mouth, it yeah. lands differently, especially yeah. from an expert. And so that that idea of, of being willing, being willing to seek out that expertise and, and putting aside some of the head trash around shame or I'm not good enough or, or judgment because really good experts are not sitting in judgment, they're sitting in your success. And so to get out of that, you know, oh my gosh, but they're going to think I'm not good enough either. And when they're giving me harsh feedback, they're judging me and how we get out of our own way. And so talk a little bit, Miriam, because I know with the number of clients that you've had and, and really helping them move and then yourself moving through this process, how would you tell people to really think through getting out of their own way? to really align with what their real purpose is trying to do. Because we're our own worst enemy, right? We, we get in the way. <laughs> yes. No, I, and I'm, I'm very resonant to that. And in fact, during the early days of COVID, we did a lot of pro bono consulting and a lot of mm -hmm. pro bono coaching because it was actually, a very, I almost felt like, is there some unseen uh group that is running yes. a global human experiment right because <laughs> i literally felt like we had all been in little individual boxes that were really little right. rats mazes mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden and in, in the dark right and then somebody pulls off the little house and and yes. the rats maze and now all the rats were like frozen like yeah <laughs> 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 who are you right, who are you? <laughs> right? and so there was this total moment where everybody yes. was frozen mm -hmm. and like almost like galloping to the edge of the cliff yes right mm -hmm. and I think that it was that pronounced because it's what exists within us on every day yes. of the week so yes there was some coaching that I did and I did turn it into a little course 
-hmm. called communicate to win, harness your Mm -hmm. inner voice. And so we have to first be able to distinguish which voice is speaking. Yes, yes. And so we have to, honestly, the first thing we have to do is learn how to get really still Mm -hmm. inside. Yes. And listen, you can start to be able to tell, oh, that's coming from here or that's coming from deep within me. Yes. And so it's a matter of looking for that which comes from within you, which is mm-hmm. more truth oriented than what you're hearing here. Yes. Right. And so, for example, um, and in that course, you learn to do that. Uh, I, yeah. I had my client literally say, OK, tell me about again. You came from this war-torn country as this amazing professional and and like you landed on your feet. You're an amazing leader today. Like, tell me about how you did that. So she's telling me this amazing story. And I was like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh. I said, so if you had one word to slap on that story of character and virtue, what would it Mm -hmm. have been? Mm -hmm. And she said, perseverance. And I said, right. And I said, I would also dare say, knowing you across time, resilience. Yes. And I said, so instead of looking at the edge of the cliff and saying, I'm going over the edge, I'm losing my job, my family's going down, Mm -hmm. we're all going down, this is just bad news. That's one view, but you're you're compelled to look at it because of your emotional history and something called fear. You got two choices, fear or faith. Right. So now even doing the exercise of what, what are the faith views that I could have? Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. I may get released from this position, but I may land in another one that I never would have thought of. And it could be the best thing that has ever happened to me. It could be right. the greatest opportunity. So by the end of that coaching, she really had started to learn how to look at a blank canvas as a great mm-hmm. opportunity, not a shackle of fear. Yes. And it really has yes. to do with from where you choose to listen mm-hmm. and from where you choose to put your focus, because you yes. can only pick one. You can't yes. do both. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, and I so then that. it's, well, I am resilient. Well, you're not just giving an empty affirmation that you pulled out of a book. Mm-hmm. You've got to do the work to say, well, of those experiences that I've come through, what am I? Mm-hmm. Now, for me, I do have a very deep spiritual belief, and I happen right. to believe that it is it is God working through me that now right. he gives me the strength to do that. And then there's this amplification yes. of that mm-hmm. beyond anything I could really have ever generated myself. Yes. And that's why, so if you look at the project that will be coming out, the Courage uh, project, Mm-hmm. about people's stories I literally sat and interviewed so far I've interviewed 10 people okay and what I've and deep interviews what I've learned yeah. from each and every one of them which matches what I experienced too mm-hmm. is that there are whispers of the heart there's something that's deeper yes. inside of you that whispers softly in your ear it is a very gentle voice so yes. look for the gentle voice and if it's a harsh one that's mm-hmm. condemning you and judging you and telling you how awful you are, you can yeah. be assured that that is not true. Right. And that's your, right. that's, your, you know, and now you get to pick, well, what is that gentle voice actually saying? Yeah. And those whispers of the heart, opting into them require courage, but to act on them require yes. boldness. And right yes. there's my daily prayer. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love that boldness, you know, well, well, if you think about all of these things that you've put together and, and where you started, you know, this whole idea of, of music and musician, right. And performing on stages in that, that art form, that creative form. And now what you're doing, which is still taking this, this creativity and actually releasing that in others who never thought of themselves as creative. Cause I'm certain that those engineers at your first client did not think of themselves as creative people. They're engineers, right? It's because that's the way we train people. Engineers are here, creative people are here. It's this, this paradigm that we we bought into. And if you look at all of this movement that you've had, what along this journey would you say has been like the biggest surprise for you that you've stepped into and said, wow, I, 
I never would have expected that. And look how amazing that is. So it, it's interesting. You talk about an engineer, for example, or a finance person. Yes. Right? And I was literally just talking about this with my best friend last night. She's like mm -hmm. one of my soul sisters. Actually, just there's such a deep um, soul journey that we've been on. Yes. And I was waxing on about some big spiritual thing I'd seen. And she's like, she's like, Marion, I can handle 10 minutes of it. And then I just need you to right. <laughs> like, I know, I know, like, she's like, how do you do that? Like, I can't even process that. And it was just such a good reminder that yeah. we all experience life so differently, right? Yes. And yes. the biggest surprise, I, I was in the early days of the company when I really started to work a lot more with engineers and scientists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I still remember um, it was a it was a talk. We had about a hundred people okay. for an R and D flagship in one of the big global majors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and in those days I was still performing and yeah. I had also put together this curriculum and growing the company. And mm -hmm. Peter Possman, who's one of our yeah. he's actually been like best friend, surrogate father, amazing advisor. Yeah. He really, um, really helped me to understand how that mindset is so was so different than my own. Mm -hmm. And I still remember standing up in front of that group. That was my aha moment where I felt mm -hmm. like, honestly, the ship was going down. Mm -hmm. I just felt like, man, they're not responding to anything <laughs> I'm saying. You know, we had a break and I was like, Peter, yeah. And I was like, come here. Um, I think you better take over because like I'm not the right personality for this group. Yeah. They're looking at me like I've got like I'm a unicorn, like I've got a yes. horn on my head and <laughs> I got throwing out pixie dust and they are right. not going well. Right. And he started laughing and he said, Oh, he said, if only you knew how well it was going. Yeah. He said, they're engaging with you in that way because they're interested. And I was like, oh, Yes. That boy, that's different. And yes. perception, shift of perception of how we think it should look mm -hmm. versus the true view coming from inside, it's usually yes. pretty different. And I yes. think that that has been the greatest um, learning and surprise to me is to not be attached for yeah. what I think. Really about, for me, that's humility. It's really mm -hmm. the essence of humility, not as in I'm subservient. It's 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 right. this humbleness of like, who am I? Who am I? Yes. Right? I am uh, this this size, yeah. if anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So it was it was a, it was a big shift that day. And then you mentioned because I'm creative. Well, yeah, I'm definitely artistic, and I'm certainly like I'm a like an open channel of creativity. Yes. Yeah. But I'm also like my my engineers would always say, Marion, you should have been a process engineer because yes. I'm like, I love process and step by step yes. and technical things. And um, yes. so I think it's honestly our I, I love the commercials Sony put out, you know, a few yes. years back about mm -hmm. science and art. We need yes. both because yes. they balance each other. They really do. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it's interesting because my, my grandmother was a music teacher. And so I grew up with music. I love music. When I'm, when I'm in that really kind of dark space, the only thing that really can kind of lift me up and get my head back out of the head trash is music. And other than like, you know, gangster rap and really, really, you know, that kind of sludge rock and all, I can't, right? But anything from jazz to blues to classical to, you know, R&B, old school R&B, which I'd love, um, just there's something about the music and musicality that just moves me, whether it's, you know, salsa or, you know, Bollywood rhythms, there's the rhythm just, just really, um, there's something about it that just, I can feel my heartbeat, right, in the rhythm. And, and you and I even talked about it because we were talking about voicing and I was saying, oh, Miriam, I need to talk to you because I'm starting to find the more I'm speaking to people, it, it, it hurts, right? And you're like, that's because you're speaking up here. You're not speaking down here, right? Your energy's here. And I'm like, that was so good. And, and as we had talked, you were able to bring what I had told you 
into something that made sense to me because we had talked about music. And I said, you know, I really want to learn the guitar on and that whole bass line thing. I love a really good bass line. And you were like, that's that high versus low. You know, it's that static versus really having that grounded feel and how you need to think about how you're grounding yourself as you're talking to people. And, and so that insight around a um, very process thinker, and that's why you and I get along so well as well, right? We're very process oriented, very, and, and I wouldn't say extremely detail oriented, but we like the way things work, right? We like to how they fix, we like, you know, but we also love the music and the art and the flexibility and let's kind of move around. And, and so that ability, I think, to tell people and that, that message to tell people, you know, it's okay to not always stay in your lane. Sometimes you gotta deviate and there's beauty in the deviation because there's learning in that deviation. And, and I love that you have been in so many of these great places and you're able to translate all of the pieces together because like in that Sony commercial, they say, if you really look at schools that do well and students that do well in math and science, they have art right? They have music. These are the things that ground them. And so as you, as you think about everything that you've done and how you've put it together, you know, and you told us about your aha moment, what is the one thing, the people that are listening who are thinking, what am I going to do and where am I going to go? And, and I love what I'm doing, but you know, it's time to do something else. What is the thing that you would tell people? Maybe it's two things that you would tell people to start if they're in mm -hmm. that place of, uh, maybe it's time because we now have all this space to think, right? So maybe it's time. What would you tell people? Those two things to do now. Well, so first of all, if you're a person that, you know, you're okay being agile and creative and moving, then sit still and listen. Listen for the whisper because otherwise you're going to go off on a lot of different tangents and exhaust yourself and confuse yourself. So yes. it's kind of, it's kind of counterintuitive. Stop. Mm -hmm. Be still. Listen. And not just for one day. Keep asking the question over and over again. Yeah. Well, what season is this for me? Mm -hmm. Maybe the seasons you've had past were wonderful, but you may be intended to move into a different season right yeah. now. Right? Maybe yeah. some of the season gets to stay, but there may be a trimming of the branches. And so we've got to yeah. be willing to let those go. So for that kind of a person, that's what I would highly recommend. I've been doing that actually for like the last two years. I felt very compelled to do that. And I'm so glad that I did. Mm -hmm. If you are a black and white person mm -hmm. where you are feeling angry right now because the world changed on you. Yes. And, you, and not the way you wanted it to or would have chosen for it to. You're actually the kind of person that is much happier doing the same thing every day, all mm -hmm. the time, because that lets you feel safe. And because that feels safe, right. now you feel like you can come out of your shell and do your best. Mm -hmm. So this is an entire new season for you. Doesn't yes. mean that you can't continue doing the work that you did, but it's really about starting to realize that no one can ever take anything away from you, Viktor Frankl. Mm -hmm really yes. said it best. Um, the only thing that can never be taken from you is your attitude. Yes. Um, and it, that is your choice. So mm -hmm. Viktor Frankl was a concentration camp survivor and a psychiatrist. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and his insight was so profound to realize that not only can everything be taken from you, including your human dignity. Yes. Um, and such abuses, but then to stand there and say utterly free from inside, no, you can't take what's inside of me. Yes. Um, and then to realize that that leaves you really truly at choice. So for the black and white thinker that's stymied mm -hmm. right now, I would say it's letting go of how it should look and yes. starting to open your eyes to how it might look yes. and to have a little fun with it, as, as crazy as that sounds. It. Maybe yeah. it's just picking one thing every day that stretches you just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. you 
look for a new recipe to cook every day and right it's very colorful and then you you get inside of that experience in a very mindful way and say how is that how is that coming how does that feel mm-hmm. right okay that's great now what if i were to do this in the job in, in my in my job in my yes. career um so i'm a firm believer that struggle is our greatest joy and it is the mm-hmm. greatest thing that can transform our lives and right. I can assure you, it is very hard to let go of how you think life should be. Yes. And then to throw your arms open and to rejoice in how it's being brought to you. And I think yes. that that's, so I hope that gives enough strategies yes. for some folks. That's just, that's awesome. I just, Miriam, I, I knew this was going to be great. I just knew there was going to be such amazing insight because the story, your connection of of this amazing progress and path through music and art and business and connection and speaking and messaging that on the surface seems so disconnected and so like, wait, what? You know, I, I don't get it. Yet the way you have brought it together because of who you are, right? And how you think and how you feel and how you serve because that is a big thing on the Rutledge perspective is it's about service. We are here for others. We're not just here for ourselves and being quiet and being peaceful and understanding that if we, while yes, we, we have to be a little selfish in order to be selfless. So we have to spend that personal time, right? We have to give ourselves care and we have to give ourselves honor and we have to give ourselves some peace. And We have to understand that we operate in something bigger than us. And so your ability to have taken all of that and built this thing that is amazing and is impacting lives, it just, that's the kind of thing I want people to see, the possibilities, right? The amazing possibilities that just because you start off at A doesn't mean you have to go all the way through the alphabet to get to Z or that you even need to be at Z. It could be that you go from A to F and that is your sweet spot, right? And it's just, it's just wonderful to be able to see that. And I think people are going to get so much from this. And I am so appreciative that you spent this morning with me and with my guests and that you have shared your time with me because I just, I feel that I am broader in my thinking. I feel like I am more grounded in my speaking <laughs> when I'm, when I'm working with you. I feel, I feel, um, for lack of a better word, you, I feel very uh, seen. And most people, when you, when you peel back some of the onion and you look at where some of the challenge is, especially those that are in corporate and really trying to just survive the madness now, that not being seen really starts to drive some of the other feelings and behaviors and actions and trash right in our heads. And so thank you for seeing people. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for being you. And thank you for spending this time with us today. Thank you. Blessings to everybody and joy in the in the journey of converting any struggle that you may be having into your next best thing. Yes, thank you. I love all. it. I love thank it. You. I love it. And all of you, thank you so much for tuning into the Rutledge Perspective this week. I am so happy that you were here. Please definitely leave a comment, send us a note. Uh, what would you like to hear next? And we will continue to bring you really awesome people. Thank you so much. And we will catch you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.